Now, here comes an object from outside the solar system and it shows anomalies. It may be different. We're talking about a giant object that you can see from any place on Earth. It's the size of Manhattan Island. It's at uh, four and a half times the Earth-Sun separation. Yeah, there is a lot of misinformation. You know, some people said, I invented 3i Atlas, this object, uh, in order to distract attention from the Epstein files. Things are getting very wild. Yes, things are really getting wild. The story of 3i Atlas has exploded far beyond niche astronomy forums, and with that comes noise, doubt, and a lot of confident misinformation. So let's clear the fog. Tonight we're going to walk through the anomalies, ask the questions any rational person would ask about a potential alien object, and, most importantly, let Avi Loeb's own explanations answer them point by point over the next few minutes. First things first, you can look at it yourself. It's a giant object, on the order of Manhattan in scale, sitting multiple Earth-Sun distances away and visible with commercially available telescopes. This isn't a rumor you can fake with a blog post. It's up there, and anyone with the right gear can see it. So what makes 3i Atlas unusual? Why did some scientists start with, it's just a normal comet, and then hesitate? The short answer is anomalies, specific, measurable, persistent weirdness that resists the usual explanations. There's something really important to recognize here that Usually, when you deal with scientific matters, they have very little impact on the future of humanity. Very little. You know, if the neutrino has a little bit of a mass, it doesn't really matter. You know, when we discovered the Higgs boson, the biggest impact was to confirm some idea we had back in the 60s. And, uh, you know, obviously that affected, uh, you know, the, those people who got the Nobel Prize. But most of us continued uh, as if nothing happened. However... Here, if we ever encounter alien technology, everything will change. It will affect the financial markets, it will affect politics in a major way. So my point is simple. This is different than other scientific matters, and the intelligence agencies know very well that events with very small probability have to be considered seriously because they, have, they could have major implications. The long answer is why we're here. If it's a comet, why does its tail point the wrong way? Classic comet physics is simple. Sunlight and the solar wind push dust and gas away from the sun, so tails stream outward. But the bright elongated feature seen from Hubble wasn't pointing away. It was aligned toward the sun, 10 times longer than wide once you correct for the edge-on geometry. That looks less like a fluffy dust tail and more like a forward-facing jet. Right. And more, more anomalies. More anomalies. More anomalies. So this is so not for, a normal thing. Not a normal thing. So for one thing, uh, there was a glow that looks like an extended feature. And everyone said, oh, that's a tail. That's the right. signature of a comet. Right. And I said, wait a minute. It, it's pointing towards the sun. It's not pointing away from the sun. Usually cometary tails are made of dust and gas, which is pushed back away from the sun by the radiation and the solar wind, you know. Um, and so this one was pointed towards the sun, not away from the sun. And the question is, why? And um, actually, I calculated that, you know, it appeared very clearly in the sharpest image we had from the Hubble Space Telescope, which showed an elongation by a factor of two towards the sun. But we were looking at it like a cigar. We were looking almost along the cigar long axis uh, within 10 degrees of the object sun axis. So we were looking almost edge on. Mm -hmm. And I calculate if you were to correct for that, this would be a feature that is 10 times longer than it is wide. Uh, you know, and, and that means it's like a jet. How do we even know what it's made of? Spectroscopy, break the light into colors, read the fingerprint lines for atoms and molecules, and the composition tells on itself. Multiple teams looked at 3i Atlas's outgassed plume and found a lot of nickel and very little, at first, essentially no iron. That's strange. Every familiar comet, including the interstellar visitor Borisov, shows nickel and iron in comparable proportions. So we can figure out composition of a plume of gas uh, by um, taking a spectrum of it, which means um, you basically 
have some kind of a prism that breaks, uh, you know, that uh, a, a light with different wavelengths is bent at different angles. And so you spread the light into the different colors. And if you do that, you, you can find the uh, fingerprints, the spectral fingerprints of specific atoms or molecules, because each atom or molecule has transitions. I, I actually teach, I taught it just uh, two days ago uh, in a class that I teach uh, that is mandatory, obligatory at the Harvard Astronomy Department, where I was chair for a decade, you know, like between 2011, 2020. So this is the mandatory class and I, I just taught how, you know, spectral lines emitted by atoms and molecules just two days ago. So this is a very well-known thing. And we know the, the wavelengths of those, and, and we use them to identify the composition. Uh, you know, we know which atoms produce these spectral lines, the fingerprints. It's just like fingerprints, okay? And, and so what was found, you know, and that's by multiple teams, there are three papers on that. We found nickel, a lot of nickel, but not, very little iron. At first, no iron whatsoever. Now, usually in all the comets in the past, from the solar system and also from interstellar space, there is one comet, Borisov, that was found. It's the second interstellar object, which looked just like a familiar comet. I had nothing to say about that one. It looked like a comet, behaved like a comet. It was a comet, but it had similar abundances of nickel and iron. The only place where we found before much more nickel than iron is in alloys that we produce industrially. For example, uh, for aerospace applications. Uh, nickel alloys have a lot of nickel, no iron. So maybe the skin of this object is, is industrially produced. That's, that was my suggestion. But what the authors of these papers said is, maybe nature is capable of going through the same chemical pathway of producing nickel without iron as we do in our industries. So they made the conjecture that this carbonyl pathway, which is well known in the industry world, uh, carbonyl is the pathway, the name of the pathway. They said, well, maybe this carbonyl pathway happens in nature. Uh, we have never seen it before, but that is their explanation. Even if it's weird, why give alien tech any oxygen at all? because high-impact, low-probability events rewrite history. Intelligence services live by this logic. You don't dismiss an anomaly just because your prior says unlikely. You consider its consequences if true. October 7th is a painful lesson in ignoring weak signals that conflict with your theory. Pascal made the same point in philosophy centuries ago. If the stakes are enormous, even a small odds line deserves attention. Discovery of non-human technology would hit everything. Markets, politics, science, religion. That doesn't mean you jump to conclusions. It means you don't lock the lab door when the odd readings start. If they were to consider a black swan event, an event that you put a small probability for it happening, but you look at anomalies in the data and say, look, the implications are so huge, we have to consider it. Of course, you might think that God doesn't exist, the probability for that is small, but the implications, if God exists, the implications are so huge that we have to discuss it. That was the argument, Pascal's wager. And I think it's inappropriate, especially in the case of alien technology, because it could be a black swan event. It could be something that affects the future of humanity, and we, if we behave you know, very, uh, very conservatively, we might not last very long. Is there anything in its path its flight plan that looks designed rather than random. Loeb points to a cluster of specifics. Three, I Atlas's trajectory is aligned with the solar system's planetary plane to within a few degrees. The chance alignment at random is low. It arrives on a retrograde orbit opposite the planet's motion, which is oddly convenient if you wanted to drop off smaller probes into planetary lanes. Its course glances by Mars and Jupiter and its closest solar approach happens on the far side of the Sun relative to Earth. The exact geometry a spacecraft might use to hide a maneuver and exploit gravitational assists. Any one of those could be coincidence. All of them together demand attention. Well, I don't want one more time. A mua, mua. Mua, mua. Okay, yeah. I don't want to screw it up. Um, how large was that? That was, was the size of a football field. 
uh, okay, so of all their 100 meters. Small in comparison to 3i Atlas. Oh, yeah. My, that's my point, that 3i Atlas is a million times more massive, at least a million times more massive than Oumuamua. Right. And I immediately, as it was discovered, you know, it was July 1st, and my wife asked me to go on vacation to Aruba two days later. And uh, as I was going on the plane and as I arrived there, I realized, wait, that doesn't make sense because we should have seen millions of uh, Oumuamuas before we saw this one. You know, it's so big. And I also realized there is not enough rocky material per unit volume in interstellar space to deliver such a giant rock into the inner solar system within a period of a decade. You would expect it at the very optimistic scenario where you package all the material into objects that are five kilometer in diameter, you would imagine once per 10,000 years. So I wrote immediately a scientific paper. My wife was not happy that, you know, on our vacation, I was sitting on my computer, <laughs> but I just couldn't resist it. Right. And by the way, this paper I submitted for publication, uh, that was July 3rd or something. Um, and um, then the editor said, oh, the paper is fine, but you have a concluding sentence at the end where you say, well, unless the object is smaller than estimated, maybe it was targeting the inner source. That was my solution to say, you know, one way out of this dilemma of why is it so big is if it was targeting the inner source by design. And indeed, the trajectory is aligned with the plane of the planets around the sun to within five degrees. The chance for that at random is one in 500, okay? And it's moving in a retrograde trajectory opposite to the motion of the planets, which is ideal for it to release mini probes that will get into the planets. It gets close to Mars, it gets close to Jupiter, it goes on the opposite side of the sun uh, relative to Earth when it's closest to the sun. And that's the time when a spacecraft could do a maneuver to take advantage of the sun's gravitational assist. You know, all of these are interesting indications that may imply that some intelligence designed the trajectory. So I had one sentence at the end of the paper saying, maybe the trajectory was designed. And the editor said, no, no, no. The paper will not get published unless you remove that sentence. Wow. If interstellar rocks are rare, why did a giant one show up before we catalogued millions of smaller ones? By naive population statistics, you'd expect to discover a swarm of pebbles before the one boulder. But we didn't. That mismatch triggered Loeb to start writing on day one. He even floated a simple way out. Maybe the community overestimated its size and brightness. If not, if it really is that massive, the inbound rate doesn't line up with the density of natural rocks drifting between stars. Again, not a smoking gun, but a smoke you can't ignore. Now, we all believe that we came out of a soup of chemicals. You know, that's the scientific narrative of how human intelligence came on this earth. And so it's quite likely that, you know, we are not the first one. Sorry to break the news. Uh, Elon Musk was probably not the most accomplished space entrepreneur since the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. And therefore, we should consider the possibility that things like us existed long before us. And you can ask the question, how long does it take our own technology, the Voyager spacecraft that we launched out of the solar system, how long does it take it to move to the opposite side of the Milky Way galaxy? You know, thousands of light years away, it takes less than a billion years. And that means that all these civilizations that had their history initiated billions of years before ours could have done it. And all we need to do as responsible scientists is to check if among all the rocks that come from outside of our backyard are really rocks or maybe one of these objects might be a tennis ball that was thrown by a neighbor and the reason i say that is you know we live at our home at our at the on earth uh, next to the sun we look around us in the cosmic street and we see a lot of houses just like ours there are billions of them, probably. Now, my colleagues, those scientists who think traditionally, they say, well, you know, microbes came to Earth very early, therefore they must be everywhere. So let's define our highest priority, searching for microbes on other houses in our cosmic street. 
And I say, good, you can do that from the vantage point of your home. You can look through the window and search for microbes in your neighbor's yards, but you would need to put $10 billion to develop a big enough instrument that would be able to detect the chemical fingerprints of microbes, you know, on exoplanets. Uh, and think about the possibility that there was actually, there is a resident in one of those houses. You know, that resident might show up in your front door at some mm. point, or you might see um, an object that arrives to your backyard or your mailbox from that per, uh, a resident. A black swan event. A black swan event. Or you might see some construction project in, uh, from a distance. That might be easier to detect than microbes. So we should hedge our bets. You know, we should uh, invest billions of dollars on both fronts. At the moment, the scientific community is willing to allocate more than $10 billion to searching for microbes, but no recommendation is made to allocate any federal funding to the search for intelligence. And I say that that is an oversight. How do we balance the search for simple life with the search for intelligence? The mainstream bets big, billions of dollars, on detecting microbial fingerprints on exoplanets from afar. That's a noble quest, but intelligent activity might be easier to spot. A construction halo here, an engineered spectral edge there, a mailbox delivery in our own backyard. You can hunt microbes through the window. You can also keep an eye on the front door. The rational path is not either or, it's both. If the evidence is compelling, why isn't this all over peer-reviewed journals in the way we'd expect? Because gatekeeping exists, editors and reviewers are human. They draw hard lines around what sounds safe, especially when the word technology shares a sentence with alien. Loeb says he was asked to remove a single sentence suggesting design before a paper would pass. That doesn't make design true. It does make the conversation artificially quieter than it should be. You've just explored another fragment of the unknown with Voidverse. If you want more stories from the dark between the stars, subscribe and ring the bell so you don't miss what's next. I run videos ad light for a better experience. If you want to help me keep it that way, you can fuel the mission on Buy Me A Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash voidverse. Thank you.